Okay, today on Cyberwork, we are talking about operational technology or OT security with my guest, Robin Berthier of Network Perception. From his earliest studies to his time as an academic researcher, Robin has dedicated his career to securing the intersection between operational technology and network security with some pretty imaginative solutions to show for it. In today's episode, Robin explains why modern OT security means thinking more about the mechanics of the machinery than the swiftness of the software solutions, the big conversations that infrastructure and ICS security need to have about nation state attackers and seem to be finally having, and Robin's best piece of career advice turns into some excellent thoughts on the importance of maintaining your network, and I'm not talking about routing and switching here. Welcome to the machine, the OT machine, and welcome to this week's episode of Cyberwork. Welcome to this week's episode of the Cyberwork with InfoSec podcast. Each week, we talk with a different industry thought leader about cybersecurity trends, the way those trends affect the work of InfoSec professionals, while offering tips for breaking in or moving up the ladder in the cybersecurity industry. My guest today, Robin Bertier, is co-founder and CEO of Network Perception, is a startup dedicated to designing and developing highly usable network modeling solutions. Dr. Bertier has over 15 years of experience in the design and development of network security technologies. He received his PhD in the field of cybersecurity from the University of Maryland College Park and served the Information Trust Institute, or ITI, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign as a research scientist. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to once again be talking about ICS security, government infrastructure security, all the uh, all the juicy stuff that uh, that keeps uh, industries pumping and uh, and and cyber criminals uh, at bay. Hopefully, so thank you for joining me today, Robin, and welcome to Cyberwork. Thanks a lot, Chris, for having me. Excited for the conversation. Me too. So, uh, so Robin, to help our listeners get a better sense of your background and your connection uh, to this field, can you tell us about your early interests in computers and tech and security? What, was there an initial draw? Was there a moment that excited you? And and once you did get excited, what paths did you take to learn more? Were you a sort of a self-taught early person, or did you learn in college or in the military? Or yeah, so like most people my age, um, it all started with video games in the 90s. You Absolutely. know, they were uh, really taking over the world. I remember the, just being completely uh, um, excited with uh, games like Quake 3 and, and Arena Tournament and, you know, doing LAN parties with my friends. Yeah. And then starting to go beyond the generic video game, but starting to develop modules and plugins for those games. Uh, yep. So kind of self-taught in terms of, you know, going to uh, uh, get a book on on C C plus plus programming, and then uh, and then getting my my hands in the code and and learning as much as I could, and that led to uh, after high school and after prep school having the uh, a decision to make regarding with which college um, I would join. And you know, I grew up in France, yep. and there was this. Um, school had just opened the first major in the country around cybersecurity. And, and I thought, mm. you know, combining uh, my interest for programming and computer science with uh, the excitement of, uh, you know, protecting systems against uh, cyber attacks, which was like brand new at the time, yeah. uh, was was an amazing combo. So I, I applied, um, uh, joined that school, and then uh, and really we dive into cybersecurity. So, uh I always want to hear when people are are near the beginning of of a something new like that. What was what was the school like? The school the school that that had a specialized cybersecurity uh, computer program and and how unusual was that? I mean, obviously it was unique, but like what was what was the perception of it in in France? Yeah, it's a pretty small school, and historically they've been well known for um, risk and reliability, but mostly mm -hmm. industrial risk. Oh, and okay. and they, uh, they just started a new uh, a new class around cyber risk and mm -hmm. and when I joined the class it was just fifteen students so the the, the, yeah. the group was pretty pretty small just fifteen of us yeah I mean uh, did you have a sense of that they were you know was it was it pretty uh, you know up to the moment in terms of technology what do you, did you feel like you were kind of like on the bleeding edge of of learning new things or were they still kind of getting their legs when you were there. It it felt really early, like you could see in in terms of the professors. And uh, I remember, like one year, uh, a couple of us in the class actually took over to teach a specific topic to our colleagues uh, because you know that was so 
like bleeding edge that uh, even the professor didn't know about it. Okay. Much, so. <laughs> so your presentations were like, okay, uh, sit down, professor. We need to explain something to you as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, yeah, it was that's collaborative. That, that, that makes very collaborative. Yeah, I was gonna say it makes it very, very collaborative, and mm -hmm. and and makes you feel more like colleagues than someone who's uh, being, you know, dumped information into their brain like that. I suppose that probably helped. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, before we talk about your current role as CEO and co-founder of Network Perception, I want to ask you about your five years of as a research scientist at the University of Illinois at Champaign, Urbana-Champaign, uh, during which you, uh, and to use your own words, uh, design and develop specification-based intrusion detection systems for smart energy delivery systems. So that sounds uh, pretty germane to what we're talking about today. So can you talk more about these specification-based intrusion detection systems you were designing at the time? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, University of Maryland, and then the years before, I was really focused on IT cybersecurity, like traditional network cybersecurity. Okay. When I joined U of I, uh, we had a large research center um, mm -hmm. made of eight universities funded by DOE and DHS to uh, research and develop the next generation of solutions that would be aligned with the roadmap that DOE put together every 10 years. And so um, I learned everything I could about OT cyber that was new to me. Mm -hmm. uh, we were fortunate to have really strong industry partners. We were working with local uh, electric utilities, companies like Emren and Comet in Chicago. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so through those industry partners, really accelerating our understanding of their challenges and, and what they had to, uh, to deal with on a, on a daily basis with, uh, with the cyber risks. And one thing that fascinated me was how in traditional cybersecurity, you know, as a defender, you're always behind the attackers. Like they always, you know, yeah. are ahead of you. And, and the equation is really skewed towards uh, the attack side because they have all the time in the world to be able to poke holes and find a, you know, one opening. Mm -hmm. And as a defender, you need to be perfect across your perimeter and, and your entire, you know, defense mm -hmm. program to uh, to keep them at bay yeah you're at, you're you're constantly sort of defending against uh uh you know they're they're endlessly on the tack and you you just right. have to just keep wait waiting for the rocks right. to get like flinged over or whatever yeah and then when you shift to the ot side where operational technology where you have actual industrial systems mm -hmm. um there's one sliver of hope there to kind of rebalance that equation in favor of the defender and that's by leveraging the laws of physics like if you have a pump system if you have a manufacturing plant uh, you can leverage the fact that some processes have to uh, you know physically move things and if something is not um, you know going according to plan you can leverage that knowledge to be able to better detect what would be suspicious mm. or what would be not conforming uh, to your requirements which you don't have in the in the IT side no. So you, yeah. No. Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. That was the idea for specification-based ideas. It's like okay, we, we we need to develop an intrusion detection system for smart meters. Back then, smart meters were just getting started, uh, like being deployed at large scale. The the fear was that um, you know those smart meters being tiny computers could be uh, hacked, and then you can create a botnet of millions of smart meters to then turn on and off the power at millions of homes. And so we wanted to be able to put sensors in that smart meter network in order to really fast detect if anything, if any command sent to those smart meters would deviate from your expectations. And, and that's where we programmatically capture the specification of how those smart meters were supposed to be used. Mm -hmm. we, and, and, and from those specification, build the rules around the ideas. And so, okay, if, if, if the utility is sending uh, comments too fast uh, that would not make sense physically for a, a power grid network. Then, uh, then let's raise an alarm. Okay, yeah, that's that's interesting. I, I was going to ask if you could give me a few more sort of uh, like practical examples, but that's a yeah. So that that's interesting. So you're just to make sure that I'm understanding correctly. Rather than counting on using your security network to see like unauthorized logins or unusual network activity, you are watching the actual production of the thing and if it's moving at a different speed than it should be or right. it's speeding up or slowing down or changing quantity of 
you know, chemical in the water supply or whatever, like then you can, you can sort of, so I, did that, did that require sort of developing a different set of, would that be sort of like more mechanical tools that you were developing then in addition to sort of cybersecurity tools? Well, we had to get the understanding of the mechanical uh, side of things before yes. being able to develop the ideas. Um, Got it. Like an example as well is a, a water tank. You know, you have a specific volume of water in a tank. Mm -hmm. If there's a command to fill the tank beyond that volume, you know that's an invalid command. Mm -hmm. And so you need to have a way in your ideas to uh, capture that maximum volume of water or, or just at the speed at which the, the water can get out of the tank. And when you have those parameters, you constrain, like you put constraint around how the system is, is supposed to be used. And, and the, the good things there is that those OT environment already have safety systems, like mechanical safety systems with uh, alarms and, and uh, you, know, uh, you know, triggers to be able to prevent uh, physical equipment from harming someone or from harming itself and, and, and destruction. Mm -hmm. So if you extract that knowledge and put that into your uh, cybersecurity system, you can you know, detect intrusions faster. Yeah, uh, that, that, that's uh, kind of giving me a new insight into this. I, I One of our past guests talked about the problems of securing uh, sort of operational technology in the sense that if you were putting too much sort of uh, security software into um sort of processes that require like, you know, very, very precise, uh, you know, um, timings on, on sort of manufacturing processes, you, you know, you could like throw everything off. So it's right. That, that seems like an interesting sort of a, a solution rather than running into that. You're sort of uh, going back to the original sort of physical yep. process and then and then using the, the security to sort of catch the info rather than trying to like. Right. The, is that, is that, is, am I getting that right? Absolutely. And uh, okay. the, the the aspect we can leverage as well is how deterministic those environments are compared to IT. You know, in an IT mm -hmm. network, you have millions of applications and protocols. People plug their, you know, tablet and, and cell phone and, and you have things you're know, not expecting. And then there are millions of websites. In an OT yeah. environment, you know, that machine should be sending a ping to that other server yeah. once every hour. That data, you know, packet looks exactly the same every 60 minutes. And mm -hmm. so you can leverage that determinism to, again, detect faster what's uh, deviating from it. That seems, yeah, that seems like way ahead of its time and 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 sort of a very exciting development. So I want to move from that to your, your current work. So for almost the past 10 years, you've been part of the creation of Network Perception, which is a company whose product enhances network resiliency through network access, security visualization, and per perimeter verification. Uh, which sounds like it's 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 a, of a, a natural progression from your work at University of Illinois Amp uh, Urbana Champaign. So, how did you come to launch this company, uh, and it, was this sort of a continuation for you of these sort of same ideas that you were working on? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, it came from the same research center I was describing at U of I. Um, I was actually uh, working on two projects. One was the uh, specification based IDS. The other one was a new solution for visualizing OT networks uh, faster okay and and building a and, and doing that visualization using uh, a network model so so you know replicating a an environment in memory using what we call a, a, a cyber uh, digital twin of the environment just by oh, ingesting okay. config files of so of you're files creating like files. a like a model of like a mechanical environment uh, in a cybersecurity environment is that on right? the cyber side yeah not, not the mechanical side. part but the cyber side yeah. absolutely got it okay um, so you know it was yet another research project uh, you know the plan when you do those those uh, research initiatives is you work on it for two three years you publish papers you present and then you move to the next one uh, but yes. this one. When we started to present it to our industry partners and when they started testing it, the prototype of it, uh, the feedback we got was extremely positive. So we knew that we were addressing a, a key challenge for the industry. And so we decided to branch out of the lab and then launch Network Perception to continue uh, developing, maintaining, and then later commercializing the technology into a product. Uh, so it you know, took us a few years to uh refactor that prototype that was a you know a, a mix of of code from different uh, sources different students different um 
professionals into like a, a video product. And then uh, and then 2017, 2018, we, we moved to uh, the office from the, uh, the incubator down in Champaign, Illinois to, uh, to Chicago. And that's really when we launched commercially the, the company. Okay. That's, um, was there any issue of like having to sort of restart your research? Was there some, some aspect of your research that was sort of owned by the university? Did you have to sort of like uh, sort of start over to sort of make this thing your own? Or was it a pretty natural sort of progression from an academic environment to a, a commercial environment? Yeah, it's actually a really mature process at universities today. They have an office called the Office of Technology Management. You're working oh. with them to uh, identify what IP comes from uh, the university, what do you want to transfer to the company, and then uh, you have an agreement, you know, a licensing, an exclusive licensing agreement that's being signed right. between the uh, entrepreneurs and the and the university to make sure that this is done in the, you know in the, the right way. Okay. Well, I, I guess I've watched too many uh, TV shows where someone comes up with an amazing thing and it's like, sorry, you don't own this amazing in insight. That you <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's funny because I think the maturity I was describing came from many of the, uh, 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 you know, lessons learned uh, for the okay. last 20 years where, <laughs> you yeah. know, things like Netscape and, you know, other, other software just... Um, yeah, that process didn't go well in the past. So that's why they, they they put resources to make it go better now. Okay, I'm not going to blast uh, the TV show Lessons in Chemistry just yet. Then, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so, so Robin, I wanted uh, to have you on, as I said, as a guest on the show because of your expertise in operational technology, uh, which we're already having a great time talking about here. So, to start with, we've talked about. ICS security and uh, operating technology security um, a number of times on the show uh, already, um, including uh, past guests Emily Miller and Leslie Carhart and recent guests Thomas Pace and Teresa Lanowitz. So if, if folks are really into that, I encourage you to uh, skip through our back episodes and get a whole I ICS OT manufacturing um, mega lesson here. But I wanted to start today, Robin, by asking you about the current state of ICS and OT infrastructure security in this country. I mean, obviously, you're working in a place where you've got like some very interesting and uh, sort of forward facing insights. But I also know that, uh, you know, I get a slight variation on this answer each time I ask the question, like, what is what is the state of things? Because I know it's such a nuanced issue. And there's hardware issues, software issues, and not everyone is necessarily um, working from the same model. So can you right. give us sort of a, uh, sort of a, a heat map of, of what, what the industry is like right now? Yes. Things are moving pretty fast. I mean, as you know, the last five, 10 years, um, OT has just, uh, joined the, uh, list of targets for cyber attacks. Um, uh, mm -hmm. before that they were pretty safe being completely offline and, you know, disconnected right. from the internet. And then we've been adding connectivity left and right for productivity reason, you know, uh, to to improve the our ability to control those physical equipment remotely, not having to send a truck to like a substation, for example, every time we want to change a setting. Mm -hmm. But adding that connectivity, or you know, expanded our attack surface, or even created a new attack surface that we didn't have before, um, and and really when you walk inside a cyber physical system like an operation technology environment uh the priority that you have is to make sure uh operation like operationally you deliver on your mission right if you're a gas pipeline they need to be you know gas delivered at a certain rate every day uh, mm -hmm. if you're a electric utility you need to have the transmission line you know up and running with a certain voltage frequency uh, every day and cybersecurity often is just left as a, you know, uh, a, a priority is at a lower rank. And the result of that is that we have a, a debt, like a, a cybersecurity uh, technical debt now that we need to catch up on. Uh, and there's a lot of exposure. And that's why you see in the news, you know, pretty often that such and such uh, water treatment system got hacked or, mm -hmm. or uh, you know, three weeks ago, we heard from the director of the API about this called typhoon attack where um a hmm. uh, nation state was able to get into the, the critical networks of of multiple electric utilities um so to answer your question um we are on a uh, accelerated journey 
to first know what we have to protect. That's the visibility challenge. Yeah. yeah. And then second, um, adopt the best practices around cyber hygiene that we haven't followed in the past in those OT environment. And, yeah. You know, IT is much more mature on that side, right? Like we've right. We we have some best practices that that's been in the industry for for more than a decade. In yeah. OT, it's, it's brand new, and and it's brand new because in terms of processes and equipment and technology we have to adopt, we're still at the early stage of that maturity journey. Yeah. Now, yeah, that 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 moves into my next question perfectly because you know we do hear a lot about um, you know attacks on infrastructure on water treatment plants on manufacturing but honestly like the thing that i keep thinking is i'm surprised we don't hear more about it if things are as uh sort of open as they are so like um you know every past guest i've had on like it always escalates into some fairly high stakes discussions about just how like there's the, they they make it seem like there's just this this field of unsecured industrial control systems out there that it, it would just be like candy land for nation state attackers to so I, I guess i'm kind of wondering why we're not seeing full-blown catastrophes like every 12 hours or am i just reading the wrong news here but is there are there things that are protecting insecure systems like are they is it really just a combination of like good fortune and wishful thinking and maybe just like the sheer number of possible targets to choose from or you know like why why is this not happening like as we speak constantly <laughs> that's a great question um i think it's a combination of factors and uh as an industry i think we need to work much better on um you know adopting a scientific approach to answer those questions meaning to collect data and 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 draw conclusions from data and now we just have mostly anecdotes um but you know the bottom line is the state of OT cybersecurity today is that any um, resourceful attacker with enough determination can can compromise those systems. Like there is a a you know if you have enough resources and you have a clear target, uh, it's you know the, the the likelihood of you succeeding after some time to get into those networks is pretty high, um, and and we don't see that in the news. Uh, every day because you know luckily there's not you know that many resourced resourceful de determined attacker um going for those targets or uh you know a combination of that plus uh we are investing and we, we are you know putting those yeah. defense on a daily basis um right. to be able to raise the cost of of those attacks yeah now and, yeah to, to that end i guess um uh, that is also the the sort of persistent refrain that we hear is that a lot of these places, especially when you you, you get down on like a, a, a municipal or citywide level, that they're woefully underfunded. And the idea of having, you know, a dedicated security team, let alone right. or even a, a single security person, like is 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 budget a big consideration in a lot of this? And are there certain sort of like above budget things that are that people are doing to sort of like put things in place until, you know, you can have the resources for things like this? Well, you mentioned, you know, the, the candy land. I think if we were to adopt just that foundational best practice, which is not that expensive, we would turn that candy land into a, a, a much more robust, um, you know, field of play where the attack surface is, is contained. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. the, the, the resourceful nation state attackers would still be able to to make their way that that requires to your question like a, a higher level of of investment and budget but i think the majority of uh, ot uh, asset owners today uh, are still on that early phase of the maturity where they have to still adopt good visibility good cyber hygiene in order to no, no longer be a low hanging fruit for those for those attacks yeah now i mean um i i I know with sort of like larger, you know, and and again, I feel like we we're we're working on this sort of dual layer system of like the very sort of sleek up to the moment, you know, cyber security systems that are, you know, protecting networks and 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 cloud and so forth. Then you have this sort of like heavy mechanical stuff that you're 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 kind of working with. Is there 
Um, it, it seems like that these would also sort of be discrete targets more so than like if you're like trying to hit like a financial system and you're right, you could be like zipping through, you know, multiple different domains and sort of like grabbing from here, grabbing from there, hiding in here. Like is are are these really sort of being defended like you would defend like a small fort or something like that where it's yeah. like there's there's not like a lot of like jump from like one one place to another right you yeah, know we call those crunch rules right like it's mm. the most critical system you have in your OT environment um, yeah. so if your electric utility that's your energy management system um, or like a power plant and then you uh, yeah absolutely you according to the uh, regulatory framework like like NERC, NERC SIP, uh, you define an electronic security perimeter, uh, ESP, around that those crown jewel equipment. And then mm -hmm. uh, you have that cyber hygiene, that best practices to, uh, you know, make sure that file rules are correctly configured, that you have a process in place around change management to make sure that no one can add a rule that, you know, would be opening a, a, an expected access into your ESP without knowing. Uh, and then, uh, and you continuously monitor for suspicious things that could happen. Uh, one of my past guests was someone who facilitated sort of, and, and, and they would do this sort of citywide, but these sort of um, disaster simulators where you would get mm. multiple industries and companies and, and, and sort of like, create sort of a, you know, a, a, a focused nation state cyber attack on the city from multiple levels, you know, municipalities and stuff like that. Is that, is that something that, that comes into play at all within these, these things, or is it, or are you really just like, we just got to keep that, that water supply <laughs> from changing, changing chemicals, you know, unauthorized or whatever, or, or do you, do, do you think in terms of sort of like, catastrophic like giant you know attacks like that and and how does what what part you know the thing that you're securing plays in that it's all about risk assessment so those tabletop exercises can be extremely valuable and i really recommend everyone to every organization to adopt them we, we do that at Central perception mm -hmm. actually we had one this week where you come up with different scenarios uh you know a ransomware or uh you know some uh, phishing uh attack that uh, lead to one of the administrator account being compromised. Mm -hmm. And then you go from that scenario into, okay, how do we uh, protect against it? How do we detect it? How do we contain it? And how do we recover from it? And step-by-step step mm -hmm. around the table, uh, we go and we check our processes or, 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 or uh, you know, mitigating controls. Um, and, uh, and then we make sure that we don't have gaps. And for sure, every time we do that exercise, there are gaps identified that we can then prioritize yeah. based on the level of risk, uh, you know, a typical risk matrix, right? Like the, the severity, the frequency, or the likelihood. Um, and then you focus on, the, you know, what could disrupt your business uh, uh, the most based on uh, on those combinations. And so in the electric sector, which is the, the industry I know the best, um, every two years you have uh, GridX, which is a, a nationwide exercise involving uh, hundreds of utilities around that type of scenario, it, it goes for for two days, and then um, and and you you make sure you have the right processes. Like for example, just uh, you know, do you know the contact information of your uh, local FBI field officer? Because if something mm -hmm. bad happened, you know, who do you need to contact? Who do you need to escalate? Which resources can you use uh, to uh, you know? mitigate and recover faster yeah i i think that's um that, that moves in my next question here i wanted to talk more about uh you know the bread and butter here of cyber work is, is to help students and new cybersecurity professionals sort of sharpen their skills needed to enter cybersecurity or if people are coming to it from other industries say maybe manufacturing or, right. or heavy industry or whatever um they want to sort of move into the cyber side of things. Uh, I think one of the things that you always hear that I hear when I hear this is that you're looking for people that aren't just sort of applying the next patch or solving the immediate leak in the wall. Like you're you're thinking on such like a, a, a massive level in terms of um, what if this happens? What if this happens? And you have like the risk element and you have this sort of simulation element, but also you're thinking about these things in this in this larger way. So for listeners who are passionate about the idea of securing these critical industries, what are the most important skills, experiences, hard skill training, certifications, and soft skills that they would need to actively pursue this type of work? 
Yeah, it's it's uh, challenging because you need kind of a dual background. You need a background in cybersecurity. You need to understand mm -hmm. networks and and systems from the cyber side, but also to be effective in the uh, OT uh, or industrial environment, you need to have that additional background, almost like an engineering background, where mm -hmm. you understand the mechanics and and how things are are working at a you know system wide level, as you just you just mentioned. Because right. without this you won't be able to understand the unique constraints of those environments that are so important to take into account for your cybersecurity solution to be effective. And, and uh, there's always that uh, you know, battle between, oh, we have a cybersecurity issue, let's just bring an IT solution into OT, and that's it. And, and it never works because mm -hmm. of those unique constraints. You, know, you have geographically dispersed sites. Uh, you have legacy equipment. Uh, you have that reverse set of priority that I was mentioning earlier around, you know, availability being so much more important than, you know, in confidentiality. Uh, and so, yeah. uh, like in the electric substation, often you have less than a week per year to do any change into a network. It's not like in IT where you can patch something, reboot, or you just add a new server, on, you know, the next uh, you know, right. next, next week. You have to plan month in advance in order to be able to make any change to those critical environments. Um, and so for, um, for the workforce there to be uh, you know, efficient and, and it's, 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 it's a fascinating career like, because it's really a, a career of a cyber defender with a, with a mission, right? with a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, but to be effective, yeah, having those, that's, that joint background uh, is extremely important. And then uh, in terms of soft skills, uh, ability to communicate well with a, a variety of stakeholders because you'll have to deal with engineers, you have to deal with the networking team, with the compliance team, uh, with leadership, and getting everyone on the same page. Um, uh, you know that's something that we are you know, pushing through the the solution we develop at Network Perceptions. Is we always say we want to have software that can be useful for both technical as well as non technical users, and, mm -hmm. and so being able to understand that and have the a good level of empathy to be able to uh, to make your cyber solution uh, sticky and and effective. Yeah, now that I mean, the way you're sort of pulling together, like you said, the high tech side, the uh, very mechanical, not computer savvy side of things, the stakeholders. Uh, you, it almost seems like there's an element of project management to it. Like you're really Correct. sort of like pulling such diverse parts of the company together and right. making them work closely together. Um, so like it, when you're hiring someone to do this type of work, do you, are there certain things you like to see on the resume that say, Oh, this, this person knows the scene, like, like what, what, or, or just like, uh, you know, especially for someone just entering, what, what are some signs of like curiosity that you think like I would take a chance on this person just entering the industry? Yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, if someone is very early in their career, like just fresh out of, of school, uh, you can see based on their uh, extracurricular activities, if they had that curiosity, as I just mentioned, or if they went to volunteer at, uh, you know, at, at a, a local, uh, you know, uh, you know, local facility that, that would have those types of, of, of right. same challenges that we just described. Um, later in their career, I, I was looking for you know, boots on the ground experience, like in the field, like have you been working for a consulting firm where you've been thrown at different missions in, in different environments and you had to deal with those, uh, that variety of stakeholders and, and do the product management effectively that, as you just mentioned as well. So, um, yeah, I think the, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's not for everyone, but um, when you read a resume and you see that the dual background I was describing earlier, Mm -hmm. uh, that that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, and I, I imagine there's there's a lot of benefit to really explaining in detail what you did, you know, because it's it's real easy to just sort of rattle off like past job experiences. But like if you have a pro like a project that applies directly to this job that you're very proud of, I imagine that it's worth like stretching your resume out a little bit to right. sort of explain exactly what you did so that they can see, oh, you you literally like put this together for this water treatment plant or this electric grid or what have you. So yeah, that's that that's that's great advice. Yeah, um, and, and sorry, often as as well, I'm doing interviews as ask, you know, describe or tell me what about the recent cyber attacks that caught your attention. Like like in there, 
anything in the news in the past few months yeah. that you uh that you actually um were curious enough to go deeper than just the first news article but go to more technical website and understand you know how did the attack process work what exactly what, what did it compromise yeah. like uh and uh, you know, people know what they don't know, but but uh, you know, the good candidates, if, if they spend the time to do their own little investigation and get that understanding, that um, that put them a problem. Yeah, and imagine like even if you you know were to say, well, if I had been in there, I would have done this and this. Even if it's right. not necessarily like the best possible solution, if especially early on, if you're if you're showing that you're already sort of like imagining scenarios there I, I imagine that's probably a good sign rather than like oh i don't know any about any of these in the tax let alone what i would have done in them you know like <laughs> that's a big jump so um i guess speaking to uh the way people are getting jobs and this where are the ics security jobs being filled today is this a job role where perfect you know you mentioned volunteering at your local you know state local government uh, infrastructure thing whatever is this a job role where professionals largely work for a single company or part of the country or the city, or is ICS security more of a consultancy type thing that takes on clients and implements changes on a project by project level? Which is more common or are they sort of equal? It's, it's sort of equal, I would say both. And I've seen mm -hmm. many um, people in that adopting that career, like like stunning in a consultant, consultancy role for you know five to 10 years and then moving to uh, uh, you know, being part of a, an asset owner, uh, mm -hmm. or asset operator. Uh, so, uh, I think, yeah, I think it's pretty cool in terms of, uh, of the consultancy and then the, the, you know, kind of desk job where you, you have the same location. Okay. So you, you mentioned, you know, possibly getting hands-on volunteer work, you know, maybe while you're studying or just trying to build your portfolio. Uh, do you have any advice for, presenting yourself to sort of local infrastructure uh, organizations and, and let them know that, you know, in a way that that shows that you're you're serious about this apart from, you know, I'll do it for free, obviously. But yeah. um, like what what are what are some of the ways you can kind of get your foot in the door to make yourself look like a serious candidate at that point? What's funny is that once you start um, understanding what OT is mm -hmm. and, and uh, how different it is from IT and, and the unique aspect of it, you're going to have your antennas out and you're going to start seeing more OT system that you've had before. Like you're going to see them pretty much everywhere. Like you can, right. you know, go to your, uh, to on, on campus, to your school, and then the the HVAC system, that's an OT uh, environment now. You have smart buildings. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, it can be really close to where you are already that you can learn and volunteer and, and help, uh, you know, on, on your school or on your, in your city. Yeah. Now we've talked about uh, some of the desirable uh, traits and desirable experiences. Are there any particular skills gaps among people trying to work in OT and ICS security that you've seen? Like, what are some some skill areas that you see lacking in job candidates that you'd like to see become more universal? Um. So you know, the network aspect is is often a gap uh, because either we we find really strong network expert network engineers mm -hmm. um but then they don't have the either the cyber side or the the ot experience uh or the opposite we see really strong you know cyber uh, ot folks but then in terms of how a network is is configured how a cisco uh, firewall can be uh deployed to mitigate a, a vulnerability or, or to uh, protect those crime rules uh, uh then they're lacking so my advice would be to really you know, get on your uh, Cisco certification uh, class or, 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 you know, there are tons of free resources online. Uh, but, you know, the, the the ISO model should have no, uh, you know, yeah, uh, no mystery for you. You should be able to, uh, to, right. to, to be able to read an ACL in a, in a file and, and know what it does and, and, uh, and yeah. just start at home. Like you have a, you know, just get a, a small uh, firewall in there for your home network and start playing with it. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it, you can't, you, you can't, um, 
uh, neglect the essentials, I guess. And even if you want to do like the, the fun, sexy, crazy things or whatever, like you yep. still have to know how it all gets put together. So absolutely, uh, boy, this has been a, an amazing talk, Robin. Thank you so much. So as we wrap up today, can you tell our listeners the best piece of career advice you ever received, whether it was from a teacher or a mentor or just something you kind of learned in the field from a colleague? Um, you know, I think the advice we receive at different stages of the career but will evolve. But the best one I've, I've heard early on, specifically, you know, coming from Europe and, and moving to the U.S. was how important it is to uh, build and nurture your network. Um, and, and, you know, that goes both and ways. Here like, we're not talking about Cisco, right? We're talking about your, no, your professional network, right? Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Because okay. later in your career, that becomes like a you know, a bank account, like you can withdraw from it and, and you can, and if it's rich enough, if it's dense enough, uh, then then it's really an invaluable resources, resource to be able to, uh, you know, find the right job opportunity or or find mentors or, mm -hmm. or just address some, uh, you know, some challenges you have. Um, so that, that would be the first one. The second one, um, is to uh, you know write things down like like if you don't if you don't <laughs> set your goals and write them down or uh, if you have an idea but you don't write it down often it's uh, you know it, it escapes you pretty fast so um, I'm yeah. kind of writing everything important uh, that 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 goes my way and that's been helping me a lot. Yeah. And, and, and rereading it. I know I have a bad habit of writing things down and then losing it. So that's, right. uh, um, I, I know we're, we're, we're kind of coming near to the end here, but I, I kind of want to go off script for a second and, and ask you a little bit about, because it's, it's clear that your network is very important to you. And like you said, it's, it's, it's a resource that you can draw from and, and, and give to, um, can you talk about the way that you sort of cultivate your network? Because I, I think, especially with a lot of young professionals and maybe some older ones, like, I think the, the idea of cultivating your network comes in fits and starts. Like, you don't think of right. it as this ongoing process. It's like, oh, I haven't talked to so-and-so in nine months. I better just, like, write them a quick note or whatever like that. Like, what is your what is your sort of routine for sort of maintaining a robust network? Like, how often do you check in with people? Do you um, send things to people? Do you receive things from people? Like, what 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 is what is your average sort of week like in that, in that sense? That's a great question. Um, and I don't think I'm... I think I have a lot of to improve there, but I'm we fortunate. I'm, we're, I'm fortunate that um, in the field in which I am, which is you know OT cyber, we have some really um, good forcing events to reconnect with our network. We have conferences. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just last week was S4 in uh, in, in Miami. Uh, in a few months, we'll have the SANS ICS uh, summit in in Orlando, um, and so those. You know, events four or five times a year are great uh, opportunities to like see people in person, reconnect with them. It's funny because we were joking last week. It's like a family reunion, right? It's it's not a big space. You know, the, the S4 is about a thousand people, a uh, thousand attendees. And so you'll kind of see the same faces. Sometimes the affiliations will change, like they would go to a new, a new company. Right. Uh, but uh, but during those few days, that's really where you're strengthening the the relationships, the friendships, and then uh, and then building that and, and nurturing that network. So um, you know, post COVID, I think favoring in person interactions to nurture your network. You know, I have uh, of course now a network in Chicago, and uh, you know, I would I would tend to yeah, go out for dinner or, or lunch with. Uh, with folks I haven't seen in a while to just to catch up. Uh, and that's nice. been a, a good practice. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And, and it, it kind of ties back to what we were saying before in terms of someone who is good at the work of, of OT security is that you're not just thinking about uh, the immediate thing in front of you or what, what can you get from it or, or whatever, like you're thinking on such a large scale of like, this is a thing that requires maintenance right. in six different directions or whatever. And so you're always kind of thinking, and I, and I guess the more you can do of that sort of interconnected thinking, the better, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, wonderful, wonderful advice. Thank you. So uh, we talked a bit about network perception earlier in the program, but if you'd like to tell our listeners more about your company and, and what services you provide, uh, let, let's do that now. Sure. Thank you. Uh, no, we developed the fastest solution to go from not having visibility of your network into having a, a robust uh, map of your OT environment. And, and we do that in a very 
lightweight manner because we don't require any type of sensor or live data feed from networks. We, we just use the configuration files of firewalls, routers, switches. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you drag and drop those files into our platform. We're on-prem. Uh, we are going to analyze them for a few seconds to a few minutes, depending on their size, and then show you this Google map for OT environment that, as I mentioned earlier, that it can be understood by both technical and non-technical users. And, and having that visibility just becomes that common communication language for those different stakeholders. And then on top of which, we do you know, automated risk assessments, reports to adopt those uh, uh, cyber hygiene best practices that we discussed earlier. That's that sounds really cool. I, I like the, the 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 idea of a, a Google Map of your <laughs> your OT uh, environment and things like that. That's really interesting. It's very much needed. You you can't defend yeah. what you don't know you have to protect, and so the oh, yeah. first step is visibility. Yeah, asset detection. We've done several episodes on that as well, and and uh, and this sounds connected to that as well. So, uh, well, we're just about out of time here. But one last thing before we go: if our listeners want to know more about you, Robin Berthier, or Network Perception, where should they look online? So our website, uh, network-perception.com. And then uh, we also, um, uh, you know, posting frequent news on LinkedIn and and uh, and, and Twitter or X. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, that would be the, the best resources to uh, to get the latest. Yeah, I had uh, I had no no trouble finding Robin on on LinkedIn. So uh, and our our listeners tend to like to connect with our our guests. So uh, yeah, go go check out Robin there. Go check out Network Perception and and some of their offerings as well. So, uh, Robin, thank you so much for joining me today to talk about this crucial sector of cybersecurity. This this blew my mind. This was really really good. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Chris. Uh, and thank you to everyone who watches, listens, and writes into the podcast with feedback. If you have any topics you'd like us to cover or guests you'd like to see on the show, uh, drop them in the comments below. We are reading them and we are uh, course correcting appropriately. So before we, before we go, don't forget infosecinstitute.com slash free. I've been telling you about it for a while. You can get a whole bunch of free and exclusive stuff for CyberWork listeners. You can learn more about our new cybersecurity awareness training series, WorkBytes, a smartly scripted and hilarious acted set of videos in which a very strange office staffed by a pirate, a zombie, an alien, a fairy princess, a vampire, and others navigate their way through age-old struggles of yore, whether it's not clicking on the treasure map someone just emailed you, making sure your nocturnal vampiric accounting work in the hotel is VPN secured, or realizing that even if you have a face as recognizable as the office's terrifying IT guy bone slicer, we still can't buzz you in without your key card. Anyway, go to the site and check out the trailer. It makes me laugh every time I see it. InfoSecInstitute.com slash free is still the best place to go for your free cybersecurity talent development ebook. You'll find our in-depth training plans and strategies for the 12 most common security roles, including SOC analyst, pen tester, cloud security engineer, information risk analyst, privacy manager, secure coder, ICS professional, and more. One more time, that's InfoSecInstitute.com slash free. And yes, the link is in the description. One last time, thank you so much to Robin Berthier and Network Perception. And thank you for watching and listening. Until next week, this is Chris Sanko signing off saying, happy learning. <laughs>